Welcome to ECE 376, lecture number 16, Data Analysis and Student T-Test. Now, here's a problem. Every time you run an experiment, you're going to get different results. Uh, for example, here I measured the voltage drop across the AA battery as it discharges across the 10 ohm resistor. I measured it four times for four different batteries. Each time I got a different answer. When you get variations like that, how do you analyze that data? That's what this lecture is all about. The student t-test is a very common test. It's probably the most common test you're ever going to use. With it, you can do things like find out what is the gain of a transistor, what's the energy in a AA battery, the value of a capacitor, thermal time constant of a coffee cup, stuff like that. You can also do a comparison of two populations. So I can say I've got two types of batteries, type A and B, which one has more energy? Or if I want to take a coffee cup, does adding a spoon to the coffee cup make it cool off faster? Does putting a lid on the coffee cup make it last longer? Those are things you can answer with a t-test. The heart of a t-test is the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem, or the t-tests, assumes that all data has a normal distribution. And a normal distribution is that bell-shaped curve you're probably very familiar with. It's uh, grade distributions, heights of people, uh, weight, um, speed, you know, pretty much everything falls into a normal distribution. The reason for that is the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem states that if you take the average or the sum of random variables under some very loose assumptions, you get a normal distribution. Also, once you have a normal distribution, a normal plus a normal is a normal distribution. So that kind of means that everything converges to a normal distribution, and once you get there, you're stuck with a normal distribution. That's part of the reason in engineering we typically assume everything has a normal distribution. That's not always right, but it's usually a pretty good approximation. That's due to the central limit theorem. Now, a student t-test is kind of a generalized normal distribution. If you know the mean, you know the standard deviation, you'll have a normal distribution. If, on the other hand, I have to estimate the mean and estimate the standard deviation, that's actually a t-distribution. It looks very much like a normal distribution. You have the same bell-shaped curve. But the difference is it's a little bit flatter. So I have less and less data, it gets flattened out. Uh, the t-distribution is defined by three parameters, the mean, standard deviation, and degrees of freedom. The mean for a, a t-distribution is x-bar. That's the sample mean. It's just the average of your data. The standard deviation is the difference from the data from the mean squared. And MATLAB, when you do the function st, std, that's actually a standard deviation with the 1 over n minus 1. That's for t-distribution. And your degrees of freedom is your sample size minus 1. And kind of one way to see that, with a single data point, I can't calculate this standard deviation with a single data point. I get a standard deviation of infinity. I need at least two data points to estimate two parameters. So the degrees of freedom is the sample size minus 1. I need at least two data points. And the net result is the t-distribution looks very much like a normal distribution, that's your bell-shaped curve, only with wider tails. Uh, probably the easiest way to illustrate what you do with a t-distribution is to give an example. Uh, for example, this is a ZTEX 1051 transistor. Uh, Jeff Erickson was off to lunch one day, so I stole his bin of transistors and measured the gain of all of them in the bin, and wound up with the following data. Okay, so given that data, let's calculate the probability density function. Uh, what's the probability that any given transistor has a gain of at least 500? And what's the 90% confidence interval for what any given transistor's gain is going to be? That I can do with the t-test. To start out, I want to find the mean, standard deviation, and degrees of freedom, that sample size minus 1. Uh, so what I would do is take the previous data and just do copy-paste. Copy that into MATLAB. You'll do HFE equals square bracket, start of matrix, paste, square bracket, end of matrix. Now find the mean of the data. Those transistors had a mean of 854.129. The standard deviation is 120. And the sample size is 62, meaning 61 degrees of freedom. With that, I can tell you what the PDF looks like. The probability of any given transistor having a certain gain. That would be a normal, standard normal distribution, uh, e to the minus x squared over 2. 
you know, x goes from minus 4 standard deviations to plus 4 standard deviations. And then take that, scale it by the standard deviation of the transistors, shift it by the mean, and here's what the PDF looks like. And this is normalized so that t equals 1, just to grasp better that way. So this is kind of tells you what the transistors will look like. Um, the gain is typically between 600 and 1100, centered right around 850. With that, I can start doing some, answering some questions. Like suppose I want to say, what's the probability that any given transistor has a gain of at least 500? Well, what I do is I calculate the distance from the mean, that's called the t-score, in terms of standard deviations. So the distance to the mean is the mean minus 500, the distance 500 is for the mean, uh, divided by the standard deviation. So I'm 2.94 standard deviations away. Uh, that's the t-score. The t-score is 2.94. Then using a t-table, or a stat track, I can convert 2.94 to probability. I've got 61 degrees of freedom. This is what a t-table looks like. I've got degrees of freedom over here, probability, and the numbers in the middle are your t-score. I've got 61 degrees of freedom. I'm at 2.61 for my t-score, so that corresponds to a probability of about 0.02. Uh, another way to do that is stat track. In stat track, I just put in 61 degrees of freedom. My t-score is minus 2.9461, and it tells me the probability is 0 0.0023. So the area of the tail is 0 0.0023, 0.23%. .23%. All probabilities add to 1, so this must be 0.9977. So 99.77% of all transistors will have a gain of at least 500. 0.23% will have a gain less than 500, based upon my data. And I can do that with a t-table, t-test. Uh, another thing I could do, suppose I want to find out what's the 90% confidence interval. If I grab a transistor out of the bin, what's the gain going to be with a probability of 0.9? If I want two tails, that would mean the left tail is 5% and the right tail is 5%. Going to the t-table, for 5%, I want to go left and right, 1.67 standard deviations. So take the mean minus 1.67 standard deviations, the mean plus 1.67 standard deviations, and that gives me 653 to 1055. So 90% of all transistors should have a gain of between 653 and 1055. Um, next, let's look at design of experiment. Now this is something that's often overlooked. A lot of times people will just collect data and then they'll ask, okay, well, now what do I do with it? You really ought to think about what answers are you trying to answer, or what questions are you trying to answer? What data do you need to answer that question? How much data do you need? How do you go about collecting that data? And how are you going to analyze that data? It really pays to think about it ahead of time. Again, if you don't really know what questions you're going to answer, you could really collect any data. It doesn't matter. Um, that's really what design of experiment is. Think about what you want to do. Think about the data that you need. And the reason for that is if you collect data, go off, sometimes it's really hard to set up that experiment again and collect more data. It's a whole lot easier to spend 5-10 minutes thinking about it ahead of time and planning your experiment. Uh, the point behind this is you want to collect the right data, so you don't spend a lot of time collecting data that you don't need. I collect the right amount of data that I need. You don't waste time collecting too much data or too little data. I don't have to go back and reset up the experiment. Sometimes that's almost impossible to do. And also, what you want to do is make the experiment as repeatable as possible, meaning you want to reduce the variation. The standard deviation is a killer in t-tests. If I have too much standard deviation, too much variability, I'm going to get nonsense results like the gain of a transistor is somewhere between minus 2,000 and plus 50,000. Again, not terribly helpful. So let's start out. Suppose I want to find out how much energy is in a AA battery. Well, ask the first question, what data do I need? I would like to measure energy, but that's kind of hard. I can measure voltage. Voltage is really easy to measure. If I connect the AA battery across the 10-ohm resistor, measure the voltage across it, I can tell you how much energy is being dissipated in terms of watts. If I then integrate that over time, I can tell you the total energy in joules. So 
measuring the voltage over a time period like six hours is enough to tell me what the energy is in a battery. So that's the data that I need. Voltage versus time. Uh, how much data do I need? Again, you'd like to think uh, infinite amount of data, thousands of data points. Well, there's a couple problems with that. First off, I don't want to spend thousands of dollars on a battery. Um, second, it's going to take a lot of time to collect a thousand data points. And third, I don't really need a thousand data points. If you look at a t-table, these are the degrees of freedom, sample size minus one. There's diminishing returns. Once they get past about uh, five or 10, there's not a huge difference in the t-score. So the result from sampling, having a sample size of 10, isn't a whole lot different than a sample size of infinity. So I can save a lot of money if I just use 10. Or in this case, I'm just gonna use four, because I'm cheap. At the other extreme, I need at least two data points. That gives you one degree of freedom. With one data point, I can't do anything. So you gotta have at least two data points. Three, there's a huge difference between two and three. Um, if I can sample three batteries, that's gonna cut down my standard deviation or my T-score by factor five. Three to four has got a pretty big impact. Uh, then you start getting diminishing returns. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna sample four batteries, meaning three degrees of freedom. Uh, this actually has some significance. If you're a company, you'd like to know what product I have so I can sell it. If I sample all infinite, if I sample everything that I produce, then I have no product. When you measure or test something, you can't sell it as new anymore. Uh, so if I test everything, I have no product and I go bankrupt. On the other hand, if I don't test anything, well, then I have no idea what's coming off the product line. So I've got to test something. You would think that I need to test a large number. Actually, you don't. If I just test four or five items, I can give you a pretty good idea what's coming off the assembly line. Plus, the four or five items that I do test, I can usually sell those on eBay as like new, and at least get some of the money back. So I'm going to test four batteries, meaning three degrees of freedom. Uh, the next question is, how do you collect the data? That's kind of the design of experiment. If you have a sloppy procedure, you get sloppy results, and sloppy results show up as a large standard deviation. Like if I just grab any old resistor out of the bin and I'm inconsistent, sometimes I use 10 ohms, sometimes I use 50 ohms, sometimes I use 3 ohms, I'm going to get widely varying results. The widely varying results winds up in a huge spread in the results, and I, can, I might get something like, I think the energy is somewhere between minus 2,000 joules and plus 20,000 joules. Um, pretty much a useless answer. So the reason you have a very picky stickly, stickler for following the design procedure is the whole point is if I do everything exactly the same, hopefully I'll get the same answers, meaning the standard deviation will be very small. So for this experiment, what I did is I went out and bought a pack of four batteries from the grocery store, connect a 10 ohm resistor across each battery, measure the voltage across each battery using a pick processor, sampled every six seconds, run the experiment, for each battery for 10 hours. So I've got the same battery from the same lot at the same temperature in the same room at the same time. Uh, hopefully I'll get the same answer. The net result is I didn't get the same answer. They're close, but there is a difference. That's the second step. Once I've set up the design of experiment, collect your data. Now I need to analyze the data. To do a t-test, I have to convert the data to a number. If I said, here's a graph, run the t-test on that graph, I can't do that. I can handle numbers. With a number, I can find the mean. I can find the standard deviation. But I can't do that for a graph. So I've got to convert the data back to a number. And the number really needs to be something meaningful. Uh, for example, if I said, here's my data. Let's take the average. Well, I have no idea what the average tells me. I could take the time it takes to get to 1 volt. That sort of is a measure of life of the battery but I don't really know what that happens if I change that to 20 ohms. If I measure the area under the curve in terms of watts or joules, that tells me something. Joules is how much energy the battery contains. That's probably something meaningful. So to analyze the data, I'm gonna calculate the joules. And to do that, power is V squared over R, which is 0.1 V squared. I'll then integrate 0.1 V squared. The sample time is six seconds, so 0.1 V squared times six, sum it all up. That's the integral. That's the energy in joules. 
If I do that, I get four numbers, and that's what I wanted. The four batteries have four different answers. With that, I can start doing some t-tests, some statistical analysis. So with that data, I've got a mean, I've got a standard deviation. From that, I can plot the normal distribution. This is a standard normal curve, e to the minus x squared over 2, uh, scaled by the standard deviation times that plus 26,000 shifted. So that's the PDF for the AA batteries based upon my data. Uh, any battery should have an energy somewhere between about 25,000 and 28,000 joules. Now that I have that data, I can start answering questions, such as, what's the probability that a given battery has more than 28,000 joules? And that'd be right here. Here's 28,000. I'm asking, what's the area to the right of 28,000? To do that, I want to find out how far is 28,000 from the mean in terms of standard deviations. That's the t-score. So the t-score is the distance of 28,000 to the mean, which is 2.98 standard deviations. Going to StatTrek, I can convert the t-score to a probability. I've got four AA batteries, meaning three degrees of freedom. T-score is 2.98. The area is 0.97. So what that means is this area is 97%. The area to the right is 3%. 3% chance the energy is more than 28,000 joules. 97% chance is less. Suppose I want to know, what is the 90% confidence level for any given battery? So if I buy a battery, uh, what will the energy be? Probability of 0.9? Well, going back to StatTrek, if I want to have 5% tails, what's the t-score? With 3 degrees of freedom, the t-score is 2.35. So I want to take the mean, plus or minus 2.35 standard deviations. That tells me that the energy is somewhere between 25,000 and 27,000 joules, with a probability of 0.9. With a t-test, I can also compare means. So suppose I went out and took a different brand of battery, call it type B. I want to find out which battery has more energy, type A or type B. Um, that's a common problem. For batteries, I might want to know which one has more energy, meaning which one I want to buy. For cups of coffee, I might want to know, does adding a spoon change the thermal time constant? Does adding a lid change the thermal time constant? So what I want to do is find a parameter, energy in a battery, thermal time constant for a coffee cup, do two different tests with a lid, without a lid, and see, is there a difference? The trick to do that is you create a new variable w. When you add normal distributions, the mean adds, or in this case, subtracts. So the mean of w will just be the mean of a minus mean of b. The variance adds when you add normal distributions. So the variance will be the variance of A plus the variance of B. In addition, for population, the mean drops as the sample size, and variance drops as the sample size. So the population for W, the variance is going to be the variance of A divided by sample size of A plus the variance of B divided by the sample size of B. The t-score, then, is the probability that A is greater than W, which is the probability that W is greater than 0 which is just the mean of w minus 0 over the standard deviation of w. So given some data, here's two sets of batteries that I measured, type A and type B. Uh, this is the energy in type A battery with a sample size of 4. Here's the energy in the type B batteries. What's the probability that A has a higher mean than B? Meaning if they're the same price, I'd probably want to buy type A. Well, what you do is you create a new variable w, the difference in the two, so I'll take the mean of A minus mean of B, gives you 34. The standard deviation, take the standard deviation squared, that's the variance of A, divided by sample size of A, divided by 4, plus the variance of B, divided by 4, square root, gives you 58. And degrees of freedom, um, it's roughly the smaller of the two degrees of freedom, in this case it's 3. There's actually a formula for it that's pretty complicated, but it winds up giving you 3. Uh, and if you plot the data, give the mean of A and the mean of B and the standard deviations, this is what the populations look like. Okay, and it looks like A's got more energy than B, but I can analyze that. 
to analyze is, does A have a higher mean than B? I form the t-score. That's the difference in the means relative to the standard deviations, or the mean of W divided by the standard deviation of W. I get a t-score of 0.59. Throwing that into stat track is 0.7. So based upon this data, I'm 70% certain that A has a higher mean than B. Again, this looks a little bit uh, suspicious. From these curves, it looks like definitely A has a higher mean. But again, I only have a sample size of three. There is a chance that I just got lucky. I got three good A batteries and three bad B batteries. That's what this number means. Uh, based upon my sample size, based upon my data, I can only be 70% certain. If I want to be more certain, I need more data. That's the t-test. Again, it's probably the most important test you're ever going to see. It's the one you're going to be using almost all the time when you go to industry. With it, I can compare the mean of two populations. There are other tests, but the t-test is probably the most common you're ever going to use. Chi-squared is actually kind of useful when you do things like rolling dice, something that we do in this class quite a bit. Um, and again, if this is something that you really find interesting, I would encourage taking some courses on statistics. It's something I get a real kick out of. Uh, and given data, knowing how to analyze the data is a skill that not that many people actually have. That's lecture number 16, t-tests and data analysis.